Hello and welcome to Cherry Sum number 31. And this show is brought to you by Patreon, by patrons and listeners such as yourself. Uh, so give yourselves a round of applause for another year. Uh, well done. And uh, if you'd like to be one of the people who makes this uh, show and shows like this and live streams like this possible, do check out patreon.com slash Anna Cherry. If you check out the screen right now, you'll see that we have uh, a tier that is selected for your um, interest uh, that may uh, tickle tickle your fancy. And uh, you get access to after show hangouts, uh, as well as other goodies and secret Discord rooms and all sorts of fun stuff, as well as uh, an ability for us to continue making this podcast. So check out patreon.com slash Anna Cherry. And to get in the secret Discord room, you have to like bomb a wall and stuff. It's it's really cool. <laughs> yeah, Patreon will explain to you how to do that. Uh, don't worry about it. It's it's for all it's so for all the right sound reasons. That happens. Do, 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 do. It's, it's great. It's for all the right reasons anyway. Uh, and if you're uh, more into esoteric uh, physics and philosophy and metaphysics and uh, reality bending uh, <laughs> If you want your mind fucking blown. But also very technical uh, <laughs> physics stuff. Um, we definitely have Richard Rawls' uh, alternate Patreon, um, your alternate identity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we have your Patreon as well in the low bar uh, down below. And uh, if you are looking for other episodes of Cherry Stem, as you see, it is the 31st, meaning we've done this um, for, for a few years now. If you want to see more, check out also patreon.com slash Anna Cherry. That stuff is for free there. Every single episode of Cherry Stem and all the l links and references and everything you could possibly imagine is there as well. Uh, I'm just a tad behind on updating it, so it is up to episode 29 on there, but they're all free and uh, you can get the RSS link and download it into your favorite uh, player. I'm also looking into making the podcast be up on podcast players for the coming year. So lots of cool things planned. Um, speaking of the year, this uh, episode in particular, even though it's not quite the end of the year yet, uh, and we probably might be able to squeeze in one more episode this month. But in case we don't, uh, this is our year in review uh, of tech and STEM uh, goodies kind of episode. So... Uh, yeah, once again, thanks for, for being here and helping us make this uh, happen for yet another year. And uh, that ends my spiel on Patreon and how uh, awesome the supporters of this podcast are, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do it. And we really enjoy doing it. So thank you for giving us an excuse to um, talk about things that we're passionate and nerdy about. So yeah, thank you. Uh, it's always good to, to end your ear with ear yeah, with thanks. Like, you check out... <laughs> Us like totally geeking out. Uh, the, the episodes, uh, earlier episodes, I go on and on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> and uh, but it's about some stuff that is really really interesting. So uh, ba basically, I'm, uh, I'm I'm doing research in the science of consciousness, which uh, also uh, links directly to the history of physics. So. Uh, yeah, there's, I've got a couple of published papers on the uh, topic, and, uh, and so if you're into that sort of thing, you can dig into the archive. Most certainly. And I'm not entirely sure why the, the screen chat is not updating um, on the overlay, but oh wells. Uh, as you as you can see, we're doing the, the 10 breakthrough technologies of 2018 as the main topic, and we're going to riff on uh, about them more directly uh, as we go over them, as well as our personal favorites, and just in general talk about the, the, the things that happened this year, uh, science-wise. Um, and yeah, you definitely uh, do go on. Uh, people do accuse you of monologuing sometimes, but yet somehow they don't accuse me of monologuing. I think it's because people expect women to just go on and on and on and on <laughs> about, about nothing girl. else. <laughs> uh, but also the, the things that you talk about are challenging, uh, you know, so it's, it's difficult to listen when you aren't following as well. Well, the funny so, thing is, <laughs> I, uh, as much as I speak, I am not good at following speech. Uh, like, I can read something technical, but I can't listen to something technical, so psh, I understand, man. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was like, I can speak on something technical. I can speak it because I know. What do I mean? You talk but, to people. Uh, yeah, exactly. I talk and, to people. And we're talking to people. So, right. like, what's yeah. the difference between listening to our podcast and, like, talking to people about science? You know what I mean? Uh, well, it's just for me, it's ta- uh, I understand things better when I am. Uh, I mean, different people have different ways of learning. That's just kind of a norm. Uh, and, uh, and for me, it's, I've got to see it. Um, and, and usually I like it in text. If I can well, see, see it in text. That's but exactly like verbal. Right? Well, but that's exactly right. Learning, I think, is the key word there because uh, a lot of times podcasts exist uh, to ease commute and other. Um, mind-numbing activities so uh there's only a certain level of learning that is uh desirable yeah uh so speaking of that that is relevant actually to the next year and our and the direction where we uh going with the podcast we we have been trying and i call it a podcast but it's not actually on any podcast player just yet um but uh it is available to an rss link it's just private because that's how patreon does it um, so all three seasons, all 30 episodes, almost 29. Uh, I know, I know, I'm behind. But uh, all of them are available for, for podcast play, just not like publicly searchable. But I'm working on that. That's one of the changes for 20, 2019. Uh, so as we talk about 2018, uh, let's also talk about our plans for 2019. And we've been play, playing around with these with these uh, new formats, as you've noticed, of going over the, the recent events uh, and, and news and things like that. So I think we're going to continue with this trajectory and that's kind of what i'm talking about where there's only so much um science uh or not science but learning certain depth uh that people may desire out of um, podcasts in general and i'm sure it's nice for us to geek out sometimes uh, by making it more digest and and news uh headlines worth worthy news headlines like I think would be um, useful for all our listeners. Yep. And definitely let us know if that's not the case. And uh, you can comment, of course, on the YouTube live stream uh, comment section. You can also leave a comment on Patreon. As I mentioned, all of these episodes are available there. And they're available for free for the public. They're public posts. And you can leave comments, uh, I believe, as well on there. So... Uh, go nuts. And uh, we are actually thinking of alternatives and looking into alternatives to Patreon, by the way. Um, I, I am aware of, of the recent rumblings um, and Good Neighbor. I'm aware uh, I'm aware of it. And uh, we're, we're looking into alternatives for Cherry Stem support uh, elsewhere. Uh, but in the meantime, Patreon is, is something that is awesome for us. It helps. It helps keep the podcast going. So, yeah, it's a thing. We're going to continue with it. And uh, one of the milestones is actually more Cherry Stand podcasts. So um, that's the thing. And if you like people talking, um, especially if people do sex work, uh, that's a uh, bonus that uh, a milestone will deliver. And we already began filming uh, episodes uh, where we discuss all sorts of random things with the cam girls and adult stars and, and such uh, people that we know. Uh, so that's the thing that is pretty cool, I think. Uh, I think the world could use more sex worker perspective, especially now when things are getting tight. It's hard out here for a pimp <laughs> <laughs> nowadays. So anyway, let's go back to our technologies. Uh, speaking of <laughs> of pimping, um, usually, as as the adage goes, right, that it's it's porn that uh, you can look to to porn for the newest technology or the the newest trend or whatever the next also, the big thing is going to be. Uh, coal mine when it comes to free speech. <laughs> very much so, which is uh, why I find it. Uh, I mean, I find it very very. Uh, fitting but which is why the uh, coalition for adult uh, workers is called the free speech coalition so the the people um that advocate for specifically porn star and sex worker rights uh, call themselves the free speech free speech coalition uh, since uh our right to be all porny and naked is <laughs> first amendment right cracking down on porn you know they're going to start cracking down on viewpoints that are not acceptable that's uh, that's the very next step. So you you, you pretty much can you know it's almost a one for one mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to it's just it's just right down the road as soon as they start cracking down on porn you can you can count on that if you got a little bit of a uh, a viewpoint that is not with the mainstream you're not you're not uh, you know with the hive then you're gonna be get cracked on very soon too. 
Cracked down on? Cracked on. Hmm. <laughs> you gotta get cracked on, man. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, crack, all that it's cracked out to be. It's that's all it's cracked on to. all it's cracked out to be. Very true. Um, good news. The, the, the chat bar is working. A chat box is working. It just wasn't updating um, because the scene wasn't live. So I learned something about the way my broadcaster works. So you learn something new every day. Uh, and we're going to continue that way into the new year. And we're going to specifically go over um, new, you know, things that happened in the world of and field of STEM. I still would like to talk very much about, like, mental health and, and sex work and porn and stuff. Uh, it's worth calling it sex work when it's, like, not, like, person-to-person -person stuff uh, necessarily. When it's, like, camming or, you know... Uh, naked gaming or what have you um, or working with just a select few people in porn but uh, they call it sex work the umbrella of the whole stuff possibly even including uh, twitch twitch um, booby streamers <laughs> it's all sex work but uh, but yeah that's something that happened was the thought audit and uh, we've mentioned it in private or I suppose in semi-public in terms of like the after show with patrons, which that's yeah a perk that you can get for being uh, a supporter of the show on Patreon. Um, so uh, we've mentioned the the thought audit and how silly it is. Uh, so that's something that happened this year, uh, especially as the year's closing up. It's one of the most recent events that happened is uh, in, in the world of porn slash tech slash sex work slash gaming slash all the things that are not STEM that we still really like and that happen to intersect. Because, you know, technology and porn, as we were saying, it's it's something that... Uh, Tends very porn... strongly intersects. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah, we thought it was pretty dumb to have the thought audit, especially since the now people... It's time for us to play the Internet is for Porn. Uh, well... Song. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Very much so. But, uh, but no, just uh, as a, you know, where do, we offici where do we officially stand on the thought audit? Uh, I think, uh, you know, as we echoing some of our patron sentiments and otherwise... Uh, other people's sentiments is that it's it's kind of silly and shooting oneself in the foot to uh, punish uh, naked girls. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the overarching theme of 2018 for uh, sex workers and it being hard out here for a pimp is the uh, SESTA and FOSTA going into effect, the, the laws, and uh, the tightening up uh, against sex workers and now the thought yeah. audit. And it's like, well, you're having less you know, I bet it would naked people in the world. You know, SESTA and FOSTA to uh, attack pe uh, people financially that have absolutely nothing to do with uh, um, sex work at all. Well, I mean, it's, it's supposed to be... Have, first off, it was supposed to be only about... Uh, trafficking. Uh, trafficking. And they used it to attack people for sex work. But I guarantee it's also... There are, pe there are people making tons of money and getting large companies shitting on smaller companies with it. I guarantee fucking to you. And if not, then they're gearing up to do it. But uh, either way, it's, it's hurting uh, the individual. And it's it's the people who are supporting it. That's, that's what I want to talk about. Uh, the official statement on on those who uh, on the little guy on the the AFC the you know the the little guy who uh, supports uh, thought audit and things like that it's like well you are making there be less half naked girls in the world why are you doing this uh, you know you are you are watching these half naked girls why are you supporting them being punished for being half naked I, I don't. I don't understand. I don't understand. But there's a lot of things I don't understand um, that that seem to be the norms nowadays. But, of course, we could talk about, like, um, the net neutrality and all of that that's related to big companies shooting on little ones and uh, monopolies uh, that have arisen intentionally or otherwise. But... Uh, that's, you know, not the most positive of news. So, so let's go. Let's move on to something else. <laughs> right. Let's, let's go look over like breakthroughs that are like, you know, like breakthroughs, like good things. Not, not how people let's are using how... technology yeah, to exactly. fuck us over. But <laughs> yeah. we, we, we're all quite aware of the ability for technology to fuck us really good. So let's talk about some, some ways in which technology actually does help and is helping this very year. Mm-hmm. This very now. Dead air. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm making a cookie. <laughs> Somebody here has a weakness for cookies, and it isn't me yet. <laughs> yeah, as you eat, as you as munch on the cookie. Uh, right before we, I mean, I think I, I just like any kind of doughy substance. <laughs> Donuts, pies, cookies. Give me all of it. 
But um, yeah, before we started the the podcast, I baked some cookies, so um, they're delicious. But yeah, let's let's look at the thing. All right, I gotta so make sure to move the um, thing. Is we're in a slightly new location, so I have to make sure to move the. Yeah, let us know if the uh, sound is acceptable, because well, yeah, now I'm a dis I'm a bit from distant from it, but yeah, we're gonna do something a little different here. I'm I'm actually crafting while she's uh, <laughs> doing this, because our Widowmaker uh, costume has to come out like what? Oh, just a few days. Oh man, I'm distressing. A week. Ish. Uh, uh. A week ish. All right. All right. So, what about that tech? Well, so speaking of 3D printing and Widowmaker, yeah, our patrons will get to uh, see a view of this mess before we uh, head off to the other part of the show. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, we're combining Cherry Stem um, after show with the hardcore patrons after show. First time in Patreon history, and <laughs> two shows combined. But uh, yeah, our patrons will get to see the the, the crafting all across the uh, the living room. But all of it's three D printed, and uh, that's our first topic today on the ten breakthroughs is the three D metal printing. Whoa! Uh, so three D printing itself has been around for decades, and uh, it uh, so far is pretty much a domain of, of hobbyists and uh, designers who produce prototypes and, you know, cosplayers. And cosplayers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, this, this article doesn't acknowledge cosplayers, but... <laughs> um, but now, however, it's because, uh, becoming cheap and easy to uh, get a 3D printer and manufacture and print you some parts. And um, that has, uh, has led to the fact that um, in 2017... A 3D printing company, Mark Forged, uh, which was a small startup based outside of Boston, released the first 3D metal printer, and it was under a hundred thousand dollars. So you can, you know, instead I mean, they of just were, they 3D printed a freaking car or something like that, but that was like a single. The same like it's now a commercial uh, endeavor, which is uh, that that's that changes the game. Like whenever somebody is just doing a new, completely new experimental thing. I mean, we hear about that. I'm sure a few people have seen the the car frame that was that was completely 3D printed, uh, but this is uh, now actually reaching a commercial level where manufacturers will probably actually like multiple manufacturers may start using this as a process. Whereas before it was just kind of you know a new interesting theoretical thing that wasn't you know part of the whole manufacturing process, but you know a new exper experimental sort of tech. Yeah, the uh, now it's become a super mainstream though in terms of metal printing, and this was in 2017 that the first printer came out. But now that we're you know finishing up with 2018, uh, we've gone up much further in uh, metal printing to the point where GE is about to release a metal printer of their own, uh, and they uh, of course been uh, apparently a long term proponent of using 3D um, printed uh, pieces in aviation. So, and I'm, I'm assuming they mean 3D metal, not just <laughs> plastic, but um, there's going to be a test version of a new printer from GE that is fast enough to make large parts that's, company, uh, that's coming out um, in, well, basically this year, in 2018. So by 2019, they'll probably have, um, you know, fully developed process of doing that. But yeah, 2018, one of the breakthrough technologies is that uh, they're the test printer from GE is is doing its its metal thing. And um, the printing of metal parts altogether is getting easier. So uh, they even have desktop metal is now a, a program uh, kind of thing that offers software for for printing stuff uh, uh, with metal. So they're, you know, going into development of metal 3d printing from from every angle that is required for 3d printing as, as as someone who has since this summer been involved in in 3d printing as a hobby uh i have uh witnessed it uh firsthand and uh, as richard all has been doing it and uh, there's a lot that is involved in 3d printing not just the actual manufacturing process itself of having you know your printer uh, spool out the plastic and you know layer by layer in a particular shape but there's also the the modeling of it and you need software to do that and the 
So the, the process of the printer talking to your computer and, you know, how you visualize the thing that it's going to print and, you know, the software that is required for that. There's a lot of uh, moving parts that are that make up uh, 3D printing. So yeah, it's, there's been basically it's, there's been a lot of development on it. There's still um, there's still some some issue with the fact that there's not a whole lot of uh, uh, software um, people in the 3D printing uh, world. In other words, like there's only when it comes to tools, you've got Autodesk, and that's the uh, basically it. You know, if you want to uh, to compete with Autodesk, there's just, there's just not enough competition yet, unfortunately. Uh, and so their product is a little janky. Like I, I personally have to use um, uh, Mesh Mixer, Mesh Lab, and NetFab. Uh, in cycling through all three of those for their different um, capabilities just to be able to do, you know, this, uh, this Widowmaker costume, for instance, where I've gotten the, uh, the models were, were, I mean, the models are, were actually pulled out of the game. I, I, I also found, you know, some software for literally pulling the models out of, out of the game and uh, uh, manufacturing, which is, you know, basically that means like anything that's been digitally produced in one way or another you could like for for movies and things like that they may be able to just take those things and then you know pull them right into a reality i love that i love that the possibilities are endless for 3d printing but the amount of work that is required to make that a reality Whew, yeah, a lot more work than you think so much more work a lot of times it takes I mean, it takes me three times as long to uh just do the modeling cleanup not the, even the initial modeling, which was basically the models that I got. And part of that is, is lack of software, essentially. Yeah. Exa yeah. Well, it's the lack of competition in the software. I mean, mm -hmm. NetFab and, uh, and Mesh Mixer are both made by uh, one company. And so it's like they, they've got two products that where one is shittier than the other, and they're both basically for the same thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's just funny because, uh, it's just Autodesk is like, is the only, you know, only real competitor, I guess. They're the only real, you know, provider. I mean, they, they provide, you know, it's, Hey, they're providing a good product, uh, for the fact that they're one of the only ones doing it. Um, but, uh, it's just, it's, you know, you, you end up running into issues because it's not being commercialized quite as much as, um, you know, one might like for having easy to work with products. <laughs> right. So the fact that they're, um, the reason I bring all this up <laughs> in case you guys are wondering is because we talked about desktop metal. Uh, it was one of the last things I mentioned from this article, uh, is that uh, they're looking into, or they're going into developing software. So that's how you can sort of tell that it's, you know, for real and serious because you know, you need the software. So very much in order to be able to do anything because that's, you know, an integral part. It's not just enough to have a printer. Printers are great, I'm sure, for like mass scale robotics. But when we're talking about homemade or hobbyists or like individual, not well, individual, but have um, welders consumer are, scale. Yeah, yeah. who are going to be like, OK, I'm, you know, I'm going to do all this welding work uh, and I, they're, they're going to transition to getting, you know, 3D printed metal stuff where it's going to be easier for them to do some things with their regular welding skills and then it's going to be easier for them to do other things with their, you know, with 3D printer. So, um, you know, there's going to be, uh, once it sort of gets down to, I mean, you know, if you're still talking about something that's in that range of a hundred thousand dollars, it's not yet. Right. Not that's still, level, right. Exactly. Uh, but that means it, if, if they've, uh, once it gets to the larger businesses, but it is on it an doesn't take entertainment that long before it starts becoming a uh, small business. Uh, ability. And, but, but it's also entertainment level in terms of like, you know, building models and, and minis and, you know, yeah. any kind of, well, that's how computers themselves started. People thought that the personal computer was just a, it was just a hobbyist thing and that you know it was going to be only for scientific use computers in general they were never going to be anything other than you know scientists mathematicians you know they, uh, I guess. that was the only people who were going to be using computers but then once it started to make it into the consumer market uh, uh people started finding more ways to use it and so that's why uh, like for instance uh, 3d printers have now finally reached a level uh, where just regular 3D printers, I mean, mm -hmm. where the, it's just it's just now tipped over the where uh, your average consumer could um, use it with some you know regularity and it, so it's it's widespread enough where it's it's just barely over the tinkerer level. Like mm -hmm. uh, the most recent print, printer that I got was the uh, the Prusa 
uh, i3 Mark III. Which was just III. a summer. Yeah, and uh, it's finally, it's got, it, you know, normally you've got all this fiddling with it that you have to do, and most of that fiddling is cut out, and it's under $1,000, and so when you have that combination of things where, you know, you're a fairly mm -hmm. average technical mm -hmm. user could use it. And very accessible to a small business. There's tons of people who will start using it for small business, mm -hmm. which is, that's basically what we're doing. We're, right. You know, we want to be able to... You have know, a startup <laughs> home business. Right. We want to be able to provide uh, high quality props and cosplay mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Hopefully at some point, maybe to uh, this Widowmaker, hopefully it will show, uh, you know, we could do uh, movie quality props. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know... We need so, to go to BlizzCon. Yep, definitely. Uh, and so there's, uh, you know, there's there's basically... Watch out for uh, GoFundMe <laughs> to <laughs> take our Widowmaker to BlizzCon. So, so looking forward to that becoming a uh, consumer level product. That's uh, it's, uh, that'll be good news for uh, small businesses. So you're talking, you're talking about the the metal printer. Yeah. Uh, because uh, one of the benefits of, of you know 3D printing is that it's plastic. It's much lighter. Which I mean, of course, the Widowmaker gun has a lot of plastic in it. Some metal, mostly plastic, heavy as fuck. So just because it's plastic doesn't mean it won't be light. It will be light, but it it won't be as heavy as as metal. It, it seems right, or because yeah, I mean, of yeah, because people use foam and plastic. Of course, it's heavier than foam, but uh, foam is the go-to for for cosplayers. So um, you know, having a metal printer, I don't know if it's it's gonna be useful no, for cosplay, be, but no, it's gonna be more. For, but like for props, maybe manufacturers. No, no, I, I think it's gonna be more for people who are making small car parts and. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's tons of little small metal things that you need to um, manufacture that are difficult. That are like right now, there's little little tool and die shops um, make things, and then there's going to be things where they where basically, you know, sometimes you make signage and stuff like that as a uh, as a welder. Uh, you know, and you'd be able to uh, to make things a little more precise and easy uh, with the three D printer. Probably once that once that gets within consumer range, consumer pricing range. I mean, yeah. uh, where you know they can use it for a small business. So it, it'll be neat once that uh, yeah, becomes something that is more easily accessible. So speaking of more accessible. Um, bow, chick, bow, bow. <laughs> now this is uh see i'm moving on to our our second uh that's a graceful segue um into our second topic um which is of our 10 top breakthroughs of of, of 2018 we have artificial embryos and we mean like artificial like all the way like what? no agnosperm yeah what? yeah so what we're talking about here is the university of cambridge um in UK, uh, they have grown realistic looking, which is just a questionable way of putting it, realistic looking mouse embryos using only stem cells. Realistic looking. I know, that's such a weird way of saying it. Uh, so they, they took the cells and uh, in a three dimensional scaffold and watched as the cells communicated and uh, lined up into a distinctive bullet shape of a mouse embryo that's several days old. So that's what I mean by, you know, realistic looking because it like self arranged into something that would look like an actual mouse embryo. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, and they are talking about how they wouldn't, they perhaps wouldn't necessarily grow into actual mice, but the fact that they put some stem cells together and they, you know, arrange themselves into what, you know, as a look, a several day looking embryo is, you know, compelling. Pretty damn, pretty damn impressive. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, they're talking about stem cells, and uh, this is some of the quotes from the uh, the people who were working on this in Cambridge. And uh, Magdalena Zernika Goetz uh, is uh, the woman uh, who was quoted here, uh, and she was saying that we know that stem cells are magical in their powerful potential of what they can do. Uh, we did not realize they could self-organize so beautifully or perfectly. Um, and so she said that their, her synthetic embryos uh, couldn't have grown into mice. Nevertheless, uh, their hint that we could have mammals born without eggs, after all, if you know if you have stem cells uh, arranging themselves like that, then it is quite possible that you don't, you know, necessarily need the the egg and the well, sperm. Well, basically, what they're talking about there is the ability to like normally whenever we do cloning, uh, cloning has a couple of different meanings. There's the sci-fi meaning that most people think of that we are now about that. That's what this breakthrough kind of leans towards. But before cloning, when it first started. Uh, actually, my family was uh, involved in it because it was, you know, in uh, animal husbandry and um, you had um, cattle. And what, what cloning meant 
at, at first, when it was like a real science, was just basically taking a zygote and splitting it over and over and over to create multiple copies of the same uh, fertilized, you know, egg, basically. And then it would grow into multiple uh, clones. But uh, then, there, and, it, and what was weird is there was actually a limit to it. Uh, there's only so many times you can split it. But uh, putting that aside, uh, then, then the next thing that, you know, we did is like, well, we take an, an egg that's already got, you know, it probably has its own uh, mRNA. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I mean, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it has the, uh, its own, um, damn it. What's the, 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 they recently discovered the, uh, uh, women usually pass it on. Mitochondria? My, yes, I, thank you. Mitochondrial mm -hmm. DNA. So it probably has its own mitochondrial DNA. And uh, in which case that would produce a, a fairly significantly different uh, creature, uh, you know, it's because basically you're just injecting an egg that's already existing with DNA that kind of takes over the machinery that the egg provides. And, uh, and so that was like the next kind of cloning that was being done where they're taking adult uh, cells and, and injecting them into an egg and uh, basically overriding the DNA of the egg with the adult cell DNA. But this is basically starting from just, you know, cells, just a bit, which would basically, you can take adult cells, make them, uh, put them into, well, you can get uh, stem cells from adults anyway. Mm -hmm. And so if you could then go directly from only a single person's DNA, no egg, et cetera, that is a, uh, an interesting development for cloning. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, it's an interesting uh, approach of, of the, the cloning sort of idea. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they've, uh, they've done um, some science fiction-y looking type stuff uh, with, with this embryo. And, and, you know, you can just imagine the, uh, what I immediately think of anyway uh, when thinking of it that way, that the cells self-organize, you know, that the, the little cells, the stem cells just, you know, crawled to each other and, you know, formed into this Akira looking mass of, you know. <laughs> well, they kind of do a little bit. There's like all this interesting shit that, where microtubules are used to pull shit apart and, you know, uh, and move parts of the cell around. And I mean, I think everybody's probably seen that, that, that like, I think it's a vesicle being carted down uh, a microtubule mm -hmm. uh, with the little walker thing dragging it along. I think everybody's seen that little animation before. And of course, uh, so so uh, you know, this is the mice uh, embryo, and they're not calling it a re they're calling it a synthetic embryo, f probably for a variety of reasons. Um, and that it was a, like it's actually uh, viable. Well, no, yeah, that's she. The, she Magdalena was like, yeah, no, it's not, it's not viable at all. Uh, but the next step, though, from this UK uh, Cambridge thing is to go to University of Michigan. Uh, and Rockefeller, uh, huh, uh, not Rockefeller University, and do this with human stem cells. And so that's the question, which is, of course, must be addressed, or as the article uh, hints at it as well, um, the ethical implications. And what I want to bring up would be, I guess, the, not the legal ramifications, but sort of legal when you have uh, morality and ethics uh, as dictated by various groups of people that are in opposition to each other, uh, then it becomes law or people lobby for it to be law in terms of abortion, things like that. That's what I'm talking well, about. I mean, so we're talking about stem cells. And if you can make an embryo that is entirely artificial, what, you know, where, where are people going to stand on that whole thing in terms of, you know, religion and, and well, Catholicism like, and soul? Could, and could, like, you know, dig up freaking... Uh, you know, uh, let's dig up like Isaac Newton, uh, you know, and culture some of his DNA and then like clone him. And, you know, there's there's a lot of weird shit that uh, that was just totally uh, science fiction uh, that's now starting to peek into the science possibility and not just, you know, pure interesting speculation but actually some reasonable possibility of being you know accomplished uh you know whereas you know people always i mean most most science fiction concepts i, I think uh you know uh, well not most a good a good portion of science fiction concepts are viable in the first place and uh and it's only a matter of time but you know a lot of times people who aren't really very familiar with the specific concepts 
uh, can be full. Well, they can't tell the difference between the ones that are just absolutely ridiculous and the ones that are actually somewhat feasible. So, so I guess it's one, once it starts to move into this realm where uh, it's proven that it's feasible, then it's a, uh, I don't know, it's a different kind of version of science fiction at that at that point, I guess. Uh, yes. Yeah, We're so still not there, but there's uh, at least strong scientific indication of its possibility. Well, but yeah, but the question is, though, in terms of what I'm asking is, uh, I guess, speculation. Um, I invite you to speculate. Uh, where would people be on the spectrum of how acceptable is this? Oh, well, people, yeah. there's, there's tons of people are going to have a problem with it. I mean, it's, you know. But, it's... I mean, is there any, any right or reason for... Um... Catholic, you know, like sort of Catholic uh, approach to which is the, you know, the abortion aspect, the baby, at what point does it have a soul, all of those religious questions and stem cells, which is something that, you know, was also um, prevented by uh, the religious community from uh, us from exploring. So religion's always going to have a problem with science. It always has. Yeah, but where, what leg do they have to stand on when, when we're talking about like a completely artificially grown... Well, you I know, mean, they're, does they're, it have a soul? Like, the you know, the thing is, religious people do not believe it's possible to have ethics outside of religion. Whereas there are there are damn good reasons to have ethical concerns outside of religion. You know, there's uh, questions of, you know, uh, use uh, what right do you have to your own DNA is going to become a question very soon. I mean, it already is with the whole uh, what, what's it called. Um, uh, 23 and me people you know mm -hmm. they, they've i think they they were caught like sharing too much of their information of uh, people's dna uh there's you know there's going to be questions about you know what right do you have to be the only copy of you uh because if they can you know start just raising if they can if they can make a clone of you uh you know then what if you're a an athlete that uh is you know really um you know, really good at some sport, etc. And so some families like, you know, we'd like to have a copy of them, uh, of them as a child. And, uh, and so all they got to do is like grab one of your, you know, discarded Coke cans out of the trash and, you know, and, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, once the technology is advanced to that point, then they could just clone you as a, and have a child that is a, a copy of you as a, a, a DNA wise. I mean, it's not a, it's not a copy of your brain, which is, you know, changed over, um, over time. But yeah, there's going to be a lot of questions that, uh, that most people are just not, they, they, you know, freaking sci-fi has been exploring these questions for a very long time. Uh, you know, like Ghost in the Shell explored what it means to be a human consciousness versus an AI. I mean, these things are going to come up very soon. And a lot of people don't believe that they're ever going to have to deal with it. And of course they are going to, these things are going to come up and it's just, you know, it's just a matter of time. And yeah, and AI is cool. Uh, and that's one thing that, you know, makes sense to question, you know, rights, et cetera, of AI. But now we're, it's kind of a alternate, uh, not alternate universe, but sort of the flip side of the spectrum, um, if you will. Where on one hand we have like artificial intelligence and robotic intelligence, but here we talk about grown humans, so either clones or completely, you know, grown dummies, which a lot of anime definitely addresses. So that's sort of the two sides of created intelligence, you would say. I guess it's not artificial if it's an embryo that's human, uh, but you know, um, well, if means... we have clones, obviously it'll be a clone uh, of somebody. If it's just stem cells, that's only one person, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's what are the ethics genetic, of genetic yeah. uh, makeup, right? So, is... Yeah. It seems like the question is, what are the ethics of all that? And that's, you know, because uh, we, we have to answer those questions before we allow our society to go ahead with something. Well, so, do we? Uh, we we've never I mean, answered the ethical questions. I mean, you know, of anything before going forward with it technologically. That has just not been our modus operandi. I mean, we, you know. Uh, there's ethical questions about the creations of a nuclear bomb that didn't stop us. Uh, there's ethical questions about the creation of so many things. And if we, the, 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 here's the thing, you can, we, if you do not, if you allow ethical questions to limit your technology, then there will always be questions because all, there will always be some large group. Uh, there will be a religious group that says no to every single technology, no matter what. There's always, I mean, pick any technology at all whatsoever, and you can uh, you you can go all the way to the 
uh, it's what are they called the um, uh, people who were going around in horse and buggy. You know, there was the Luddites way the back Amish, when, yeah. and now it's the the, the Amish. The, there's you know, there's always going to be some group that protests, and uh, and it, and you know, when you're talking about birth control, for instance, I mean, birth control is not like some sort of high tech, uh, <laughs> you know. And you've got the the one of the largest religions on the planet, so one of the largest you know single groups on the planet all together, you know, being uh, against certain things like that was the problem with stem cells, and and it will certainly be the problem with cloning. So, I mean, there's always <clears throat> if you allow technology to be dictated uh you know the development of technology to be di dictated by whether or not there's a large group of people who are stand against it then you will never develop technology uh so there is a there's a difficulty that has to be um faced there that there that you know uh, it's it's a matter of use more than it is the development of it uh, because uh, you know one technology may be required to get to another technology that the same people who protest the first technology will actually benefit greatly from the second one and so so the uh you know there is a question of i, I don't i don't know that uh stopping the absolute development of a technology is uh is really a viable method for you know advancement of civilization yeah that's one of the things about tools is uh, like a knife, you know, it's a murder weapon, but it's also, you cut down trees to build a house, you cut down the food. It's going to be awfully difficult. <laughs> cut down your food. You, you get the point. Defend your family. Like, you could, you can use it for three good things versus one bad thing. Uh, so that's just, you know, seems to be a adequate uh, analogy for technology in general, where, you know, one, one evil thing. <laughs> Some people may want to use a knife for cutting down a tree. You don't know. <laughs> it's a tiny tree. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Trees are relative. Uh, uh, title. Yeah. Noun. It could be a baby tree. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of baby trees uh, and, and such, this, this next one's neat for, for uh, Bradbury fans. And uh, those who have uh, read his, his short stories will, will know where I'm coming from. Um, and for those who don't, not to, not, not to worry. I will, I will discuss it uh, after I present the story. So the next one um, that we have on the list of our 10 things is uh, something that's not scrolling. Um, come here. There we go. All right, so we're talking about a sensing city. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, yeah, uh, it's. It sounds uh, like a, a futuristic like warrior club or something. I don't know. <laughs> Aha! I see. It's not always showing messages. That's from. All right. Um, yeah, it's uh, sensing city is uh, <laughs> does sound like some sort of Rapongi like club. Um, it does, yeah. but no. This this is very Bradbury esque, and why you you'll, you'll see why after I, I read uh, more to you all about what this is all about. And uh, that's number number three, uh, breakthrough technology of uh, of 2018. So um, there we go. All right. So uh, it's basically a smart city. So you know you, you have a smartphone. Oh, we've had those for quite some time, and and I struggled for a long time to understand the meaning of smartphone, and then I figured out it's it's just something that like can go on the internet. So uh, the difference between you know not smartphones the smartphones is that it has a uh, a touch screen usually and uh, more, more often than not it can do internet uh, things that a computer can do but touch screen is also a pretty big part of it so um now connectivity to internet and touch screen uh in that order i would say are prerequisites of a smart anything so whenever you have a smart tv uh what does it do well it can connect to uh, netflix or it can connect to um spotify or pandora or something through the tv itself so once again what's that uh, internet connectivity so it, the, to me uh i've been struggling with the definition of smart technology uh, i'm sure there, there actually is a literal definition that it just occurred to me to look up, but um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, you like you hear you hear labels, you hear certain names for what things, does it mean? right, right, what and it mean? just plays in the back of your mind, and you're like, what, what is that? And so you're like, you know, try to parse the part lazily once in a while. You you, you pick up this, uh, you know, label and examine it. So um, 
so we have uh, smart fridges um, and uh, other things where people have gotten smart homes, where people have gotten in trouble in, in some ways or others uh, when their uh, technology was malfunctioning for their smart fridges and they've been hacked through those and their smart homes uh, when their you know, tech is being weird. That can be rough. Uh, but uh, we're talking about a whole smart city. So um, there have been numerous smart city schemes, um, but they've run into delays. They've been, um, they had to dial down their ambitious goals or they've been priced out um well they not themselves not they themselves have been priced out but uh the way how much it would cost to make them it would price out everyone except super wealthy people so it wouldn't be you know it wouldn't be tenable to to build them so um it's something that's been kind of on the back burner of um technological innovation i guess you could say but a uh, project in uh, Toronto called Quayside um, is hoping to change um, this pattern uh, of failures by rethinking an urban uh, neighborhood from the ground up and are building it around the latest uh, digital technologies. So here we have Alphabet Sidewalk Labs, which is based in New York City uh, and is collaborating with the Canadian government on this high tech project which is slated for uh, being built on Toronto's industrial waterfront. Um, now, before uh, people go talking shit about Trudeau and his spending of money, <laughs> uh, do uh, consider it is uh, definitely a attraction for tourists, for sure. And uh, not to mention, if it works, uh, this could be a really cool thing on how to innovate our cities. And uh, sometimes something that is an innovation can that you spend money on in the short term that's you know some quite bit of money can save a whole lot of money in the long term uh which is uh, why the whole flint uh crisis happened actually is that it was found that if you just rerouted the water you could you know save a lot of money and they were trying to do the thing and then problems happened uh because they didn't Wait, account what? for things what happened with the was... flint uh yeah there was like uh, it has something to do with rerouting water from where they've been getting it from and they're like well it'd be re it'd be cheaper in the long term to do this other thing but what wasn't accounted for is the fact that it the pipes are super old and it actually is cheaper to rebuild and replace oh, all the I pipes see. and flint was like ah, fuck yeah, replacing yeah. pipes but now it's what they're having to do right uh, yeah because... well, like people take like it's like buying a shitty old car it's like uh, you end up what you pay in repairs and shit like that ends up being you you think you save money but basically you made a short-term decision instead of a long-term decision and that's usually what what happens ends up happening is a lot of times people make short-term decisions and don't uh, and don't recognize them as short-term decisions that's what uh, you know when you're talking about investing in the future you, you're talking about long-term thinking versus short-term thinking and uh you know there's always there's always some short-term thinking way of saying it's like oh we don't need to spend that money uh when in fact you're actually saving money by spending it Right, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, so uh, so I know that we have Canadian listeners, and I know it's uh, it's kind of a meme to talk shit about Trudeau. So I was mostly joking, but also for real. Uh, kind of a, a side note, where it's like, well, why would you spend... Uh, it's collaboration between the two governments, though, or the, the two countries, I guess, not governments necessarily. Um, uh, the city of Toronto is not necessarily even Trudeau, and this um, sidewalk labs in, in New York um, is not the U.S. government, but it is two countries, uh, two different companies from uh, the border on either side uh, working together to do this thing. And you would think, like, why spend money on that, right? Like, why would this be a thing? Why would you need to uh, waste resources on a smart city? Like, why? Uh, but sometimes things like that, uh, and this made me also internally think about like Elon Musk and that he's, you know, uh, doing the boring company uh, under the uh, borrowing under the ground, trying to do the, the fast um, travel and like, you know, things like that, that uh, and of course, you know, space and potentially Basically uh, very long term thinkers a lot of right. look like frivolous, you know, to, to people who don't know that they're short term thinkers. Uh, they uh, they see those kind of expenditures as frivolous when in fact it's uh, it's the not spending the money where you need to that is sometimes the frivolous um, way of doing things. Right. So, and you definitely need to be investigating uh, potential things, and uh, there are certain rich people, millionaires, what have you, uh, who put their money into uh, something that would help us continue surviving 
given all the threats that we as a species are currently facing here. So um, I feel like it's potentially one of those things, but it could it could also be trash. You never know. Uh, but just reading this and maybe think of Elon Musk and, and sort of the things uh, that he is doing and what uh, Bezos is trying to do too with the, the load to the moon. Who knows what that even is all about. And with Musk, um, you know, potentially talking about um, colonies, uh, extraterrestrial colonies. And uh, what that means is uh, extraterrestrial means outside of Earth. So humans, uh, you know, going off of the Earth and uh, potentially relocating elsewhere and solving some of our problems such as population and uh, climate change and other things that, and, you know, other things that are threatening our existence here on this rock. Uh, some of that can also be saved or helped. Uh, or mitigated the, the disaster that could potentially happen uh, from a variety of like a variety of things. It could even be uh, something we didn't do, like a meteor hit or reversal of the poles, and uh, you know, like uh, a radioactive wind hitting us uh, and and wiping out most of humanity. You know, it could be something like that, or it could just be increasing heat. Uh, so we you know we need to look for alternatives, and some of that could be technology. Very well, um, it could be technology that that saves us from that. So if we can have uh, smart fridges <laughs> and smart uh, phones that are regulated fairly easily uh, by uh, technology, uh, you know, why can't we have a whole smart city? So um, that could be a way to mitigate and, and use technology to shield ourselves uh, from potential dangers of uh, continuing, you know, to survive so, uh, on the earth. What's, uh, so, what's the use of Okay, so one of the one of the project's goals, right? Uh, one of the project's goals is to base uh, decisions about design, policy, and technology on information from um, a whole extensive network of sensors. Uh, they're going to gather data on everything from air quality to noise levels to people's activities. So uh, it's a little mini utopia. <laughs> um, so the, the the plan calls for all vehicles to be autonomous uh, and shared. Love it. Uh, robots will roam underground doing menial chores like de delivering the mail. Uh, also love it. Uh, Sidewalk Lab says it will open access to the software and systems it's creating to other companies uh, so they can build services on top of them, such uh, as people uh, building apps for their phones. You could have like other companies building apps for the city. Uh, so uh, they don't say it's a utopia, but that's what it sounds like. <laughs> you have a little robot. Oh, so you say utopia, people are automatically going to be know, right? you know. Oh my God! And so you, you don't don't use the the the, mm, the, the trigger word. the trigger word. The trigger, you, they'll get triggered. Sorry, little right wing snowflakes. Um, the company intends to closely monitor public infrastructure, and uh, this raises concerns about data governance and privacy, as always. Uh, Cyber Labs believes it can work with the community and local government to alleviate the worries. So they, they got a quote here. Um, uh, what's distinctive about what we're trying to do in Quayside? So they're actually like like building this in Toronto. Like that's that's a thing that they're gonna do. So it's a little uh, like. Um, Experiment cage, I guess. <laughs> uh, what's what's distinctive about what we're trying to do in Quayside is that the project is not only extraordinarily ambitious, uh, extraordinarily ambitious, but also has a certain amount of humility, says Rit Arga Argwala, the director in charge of the Sidewalk Labs Urban System Planning. Um, the humility may help Quayside avoid the pitfalls um, that plagued other uh, such uh, projects. But uh, the way uh, me reading that quote is, I don't know, it comes off kind of smug. So I don't think they have all that much humility. Uh, but um, there are other North American cities that are older um, and they're apparently already clamoring to be next on Sidewalk Labs' list. Uh, so they, like San Francisco, Denver, Los Angeles, and Boston have all been asking for introductions to this um, company to or to the the people who are seeing the development of, of this thing uh because they want the same treatment in their city uh, so basically all of the the problems of urban sprawl they're trying to right. plan for them they're and, trying to measure and, them and they therefore design cities from the ground up right uh planning for all the problems that you run into when you do anything when the city just kind of comes together uh on its own Right, exactly. They're they're looking at uh, issues that arise from because I mean we we haven't had civilization, and um, 
production at a rate that we've had for the past 50 years pretty much ever before so uh the past 100 years things have you know radically and and rapidly changed so there's all sorts of impacts on not that many generations only 100 years that's like basically one generation really if you think about it uh so there have been all sorts of effects that have happened uh, on human health and lives and mental health and all sorts of things the that people typically consider generations is weird it's, uh, there's actually yeah, yeah they, they, they consider numerous generations within 100 years uh it's like uh, every 10 uh, years or something i'm wondering how they do that it's like how exactly do you say was well, it like a birth and age so yeah, when I, you're like 15 20 that's a new generation because you get know. birth babies yeah. or yeah maybe it's every 20 years what is a generation that's a good question. I mean, I know, I know different people consider it, you know, in different ways. That's for sure. So, next topic. Speaking of smart cities, and just in general, uh, smart things. AI! You get AI, and you get AI, and you get an AI. AI for everybody. AI, everybody. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is actually, uh, I got uh, two stories on that. Um, it is one of the breakthrough technologies of 2018. Uh, but I do have an even more recent story, um, other than just the entirety of 2018, where we have um, one of the recent things that came out in December, so early December, um, oh, December 3rd, is that we have um, AI can predict Alzheimer's uh, years before diagnosis. So uh, yeah, they did some some um, studies on the recognition ability of AI and people who had Alzheimer's and uh, seeing the predictive rate and ability of AI and apparently they kick ass uh, at years before an actual uh, Alzheimer's diagnosis. So um, I'm not too well versed on amyloid uh, beta plaques and um, how... Yeah, but I'm like, yeah, how, how the whole Alzheimer's things works in terms of uh, preventative measures. So I don't know if uh, have if yeah, knowing it's like you're getting shit's right. gonna suck for you, and there's nothing we can do about it. So uh, yeah, good luck with that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now you know many years in advance. Well, you're still you're still cognizant enough to really appreciate how fucking horrible this is about to be. <laughs> thanks, thanks, technology. <laughs> well, I mean, here, <laughs> uh, I think uh, more than anything, this was a proof of concept for the algorithm. Right, right. <laughs> they wanted to see how well it did for uh, you know certain biomarkers, and um, you know they're talking about how uh, this actually published in radiology. So it's about how it could help a radiobiologists detect things. So it's just kind of a niche uh, <laughs> market there, uh, but. Um, there could be therapeutic intervention um, in a variety of other diseases. So if the algorithm can, yeah, yeah, of yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it could be for I, Alzheimer's. I, I just don't know. That's all. I, I just wanted. Yeah, I, I know you're joking, of course, right. and so does, so does everyone. But I just wanted to throw it out there that I don't know if this is useful in this particular case because I just don't know much about Alzheimer's. Um, so caveat, full disc full disclosure. Um, but is it caveat emptor? Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, um, independent test was pretty small is, is what the, um, Dr. Son, Son I think is the, um, uh, who, who did the study. That's who done it? Whoa, that sucks. Oh, never mind. Um, oh, what? Eh? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, the, um, the test, uh, sample was fairly small. Uh, so there definitely needs to be more research done on that. But uh, in general, the fact that they're using AI for detection of such things at all is, is really fascinating to me. But of course, we have the AI for everybody. So, uh, you know, what is this? Uh, what is this article talking about? What's it talking about? What's this? So, uh, so far, you know, of course, everyone knows AI, uh, so far mainly other than Tay, um, mainly it's the uh, Amazon and um, like Alexa and things like that. But um, AI is uh, at the heart of many tech companies like Amazon, Baidu, uh, Microsoft, of course, 
But yeah, things like Amazon and Google, like you have uh, learning algorithms and neural networks and things like that uh, that help you with predictive shopping and predictive text and uh, a variety of things. Uh, they're actually using artificial, like smaller versions, I guess, not like a full thinking what we would think of. That's not generally uh, right. right. We wouldn't think of it as like a yeah, it's not like Terminator right. where it's like it's a, a full gigantic actually a gigantic difference between a. Uh, AI that is uh, specialized to one specific task and a general intelligence AI. That is a, a leap that uh, is massive that we are not, you know, uh, not particularly close to. Right. So, yeah. So it is AI that these companies are using, but it, they're sort of like playing around with AI, like you know you're saying. It's baby AI. It's not... Yes. It's a p. It's like taking one little tiny part of your brain. It's like you you, you could use like the, the language center of your brain. It does some some awesome shit by itself. It's not your whole brain. You can remove your language one of your language centers. The other, I forget if it's Wernicke's or Broca's, but and not be able to speak and be a normal human otherwise. Like everything else about you is still normal. You just can't freaking speak anymore because we've removed your Wernicke's. I'm I'm going with Wernicke's. Might be might be Broca's. Uh, and so it's just, a, you know, that's, that's kind of, and that, that by itself is, would be like a super powerful AI in today's standards, that one little section of our brain, uh, that would be a really amazing, badass AI for uh, today's technology standards. And, and the problem is, uh, a general AI is something like, uh, the parts to like you could take, take. If I give you all the parts to an engine, you don't have an engine until it's put together in exactly the right way and has the timing and everything set up perfectly before it can actually run a car. So just because you can make one part of a, of a car engine, uh, and if you got no fucking clue how an engine works at all, uh, just because you've made one part that does things like an alternator does not mean that you can make uh, the whole engine yet. And it's certainly not, you, do, you can't just take and make a whole bunch more of the things like that. It's like, oh, I can make a bunch of alternator-like things and just kind of cram them all together in one pile and poof, I'll have something that does this extra thing that an engine does. And it doesn't work like that, uh, obviously. And so that's, you know, that's why there's just a huge uh, gulf between a general, uh, generally effective, you know, uh, general purpose AI and a specialized AI. Yeah. But it's even more than that uh, in terms of general purpose versus specialized when it comes to talking about companies that have access to AI. As I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, breakthrough technologies of 2018 uh, as a topic for this particular show. But in general, the 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 topic is, you know, future technology. So uh, as we were mentioning with the metal printing, um, something like AI has not only been around for quite some time, but it's definitely, definitely the future. Uh, so access to AI technologies is extremely important. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, um, it's extremely important uh, in terms of staying competitive, and that's one of the issues for small businesses always. Uh, as far as um, monopolies go, when it comes to uh, actual literal monopoly of the the field, is one thing, but something else to consider. Uh, and as, as as small business owners, in, in a way, giant ourselves can get a hold of extremely technology. Easy. Yeah, uh, having access to technology. Technology that can revolutionize the game. It used to be only that governments could have competed at that level. In other words, like you could only marshal gigantic armies if you were the entire collective of a bunch of people. But once, once any one individual has to compete against that huge collective, well, of course they're going to be defeated. Well, now, now we have corporations playing the roles of governments, where it's like individuals can't because we've allowed we've allowed corporations to be the size of governments. Uh, you know, individual businesses cannot comp compete with that. So we, by our very system, we've uh, made we've put small businesses at a gigantic disadvantage because uh, because large businesses have the huge advantage. So uh, it's a difficult, you know, it's, it's not like that's an easy problem to solve, uh, but it is a problem that uh, we have. <laughs> Right, exactly. And it goes, you know, uh, on, on, on a personal level is one thing, but it, it goes, you know, many layers or levels up 
uh, and deep. And uh, what we're talking about here is with AI. Uh, currently, AI is mostly used by tech industry and more specifically Amazon and Google. Like, let's face it, they're, I will say they're the kind of the China and the America of the, of the, of the tech world or, or rather who is going to own the world. Uh, the question is, is it going to be America or China? I, I feel like that's kind of the question between Google and Amazon based on some of the things that you see them doing and what they're investing in. So um, currently, AI is used mostly in the tech industry where it has created uh, efficiencies produce new product services, but uh, there are many businesses and industries that are actually struggling to take advantage of advances in artificial intelligence because that's just not their bag, baby. Like they don't know, you know, it's expensive, it's inaccessible, they don't, they don't have training. Um, uh, so uh, they struggle to take advantage of it. Um, sectors such as medicine, manufacturing, and energy could actually be transformed if they were able to implement uh, the AI technology more fully and it could boost economic productivity, obviously not only for them, but for obviously for them, but not only for them, but for like the rest of the world or the country. And uh, most companies actually have no idea how to even use AI. So um, Amazon and Google are setting up consultancy services, but not just that. What we're talking about here, AI for everyone, what is that referring to? Well, we're talking about AI on the cloud. Uh, so um, Amazon and Google are working towards being able to put um, AI services uh, on uh, into the ether uh, and have it accessible to other companies like you know medicine, energy, etc. And also set up consulting services to help them use uh, AI. So um, for instance, here we have in the article um, uh, the solution to this you know issue of not having access to AI and also, it being too positive, expensive. So, right. Yeah, it's very positive. So making it, uh, it I mean, it's available now. So yeah, there's one time that it, that it fucking it's, worked out. Mm -hmm. Cloud cloud based AI <laughs> is making technology easier for uh, because otherwise it's too uh, so, so difficult not, to implement. See, this is one time where they're not being anti competitive, which is very. That's not standard for corporations of the past. Normally, if they want, if they could retain any kind of competitive advantage, they'd never, never in a million years allow anyone else to uh, have access to that competitive advantage. So this may be a, a change to the way well, to corporate culture. Or uh, I definitely think it's a change to corporate culture, which has been that they're beginning to understand that they are now like governments and if they shit all over the people that uh, that they because they have so no, much no no I don't think it's that well, I think it, it's it, accessibility I think they want to own everything so they want to be the one that everyone goes through yeah but there's a thing that if if they can maintain the problem is when you're that large you really don't have competitors anymore and so all you have are serfs that you well you have to google be, versus that amazon you, that you need them to be able to just, just let I can finish the rest money. of the article first Go ahead. um just because I feel like it's a competition between Amazon and Google. So they're, they are being competitive with each other by the only competition there is. exactly by providing the rest of the businesses that of course they rely on, uh, like you need, uh, and Google and Amazon are a slightly higher level beast than your average GOP, you know, um, corporate business. They, you know, they do have a tiny, tiny bit of long-term thinking. Right, uh, right. So they, they're already, you know, well, it's like eventually you ahead do, above. If, you're, if you have any fucking intelligence at all, you understand right. that you've got to make sure you feed your cattle. Exactly. Even if, you are, if they are so far below you that you can just use them, uh, you, you still have got to make sure that you're taken care of, that they can continue to produce. If, you're, if they're the ones who provide you with your energy, which is basically what it is now, when, they're, when a corporation becomes that large, just like a government, etc., it is in their best interest to make sure that the, that the people that, they, that, you know, that basically they get all of their energy from are capable of producing the, the best and most amount of energy that, that they can feed on. And it's, it's actually just, you know, it's, it's just good animal husbandry. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and those who provide the quickest, easiest access, it's kind of like free-to-play games, you know. Now, whichever game is uh, has most accessibility, that's the one that's going to have the biggest user base. And that in itself, then you have, you know, hearts and minds of, you know, very, very, very many people. Uh, that's what I think and where they're coming from. But
but um, and this is where we're talking about companies and parts of the economy. Uh, the AI systems are too expensive uh, and too difficult to implement fully. So the solution is machine learning tools that are based in the cloud um, that are bringing AI to a far broader audience. So far, Amazon dominates the cloud AI with its uh, AWS subsidiary. Uh, Google is challenging that with TensorFlow, which is an open source AI library that can be used to build other machine learning software. Uh, great little meta there. Uh, recently, Google announced uh, Cloud Auto ML, which is a suite of pre-trained systems that can make AI even simpler to use. Uh, now, Microsoft uh, has its own AI-powered cloud platform, which is called uh, Azure, uh, and it's teaming up with Amazon. So Microsoft and Amazon teaming up uh, versus Google uh, to offer Gluon. Gluon. It's an open source deep learning library. So Gluon is supposed to make building neural nets, uh, which is a key technology in AI uh, that crudely mimics how the human brain works. Um, they're trying to make it as easy uh, to build that as uh, it is to build a smartphone app. So wow, um, that, that would be fucking cool as shit. Yeah. Now, what's, the, what's the cost to do that? Because man, that's like, if once individuals have more access to some of those some of the computing power needed and the technology and uh, you know, that's been advanced that that's um, that's really good for everyone. Yep. Uh, so that looks like there, I mean, on one thing, on one hand, it is beneficial for everyone that this is happening. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't think it's like purely good intentions, of course. Uh, sure. But you know, it, it's, if it works, it works. Uh, but speaking of neural nets, uh, the next... Well, it depends on what you mean by good intentions. I mean, right. You know, if it, if it... Purely selfless. Right. Yeah, well, of course not. But right. They got to make a buck. If, if it, at least it uh, benefits, you know, uh, the smaller businesses and, and the individuals, then, uh, then there is some real actual contribution to society that's occurring. And that's what the, the whole purpose, uh, you know, whenever you're, whenever you're talking about any kind of political topic or any kind of, you know, procedure in the way that we organize our society, the way we organize our economy, you know, that's basically what we're trying to figure out is what's the best way to make it, make everyone the most productive and prosperous as you possibly can and without, you know, um, well, you know, without, and while avoiding all the pitfalls of, of that attempt. Uh, yeah. Um... But that reminds me, well, that doesn't really remind me, but that segues into, or goes directly into, um, for the, the neural networks being um, kind of the interesting part to you about this, the, the deep net and the, the apps, et cetera, the ability of individuals to, you know, still benefit off of, uh, uh, off of this, um, the new frontier that the, the two companies, the two giants have to dabble in and they have to, you know, the, we benefit because they have no choice but to go into the frontier of uh, AI and AI has to be made more accessible. Mm -hmm. It's just where we're at now. Like they can't be the only ones who have it because it's like the league, you know, <laughs> the rest of the team lagging behind is just not going to do because they need the rest of the team. They need the exactly. rest of the community um, to, to work. But um, so, yeah, speaking of um, interconnectedness, <laughs> The other technology here that we're talking about is uh, dueling neural networks. Whoa, what's that mean? Um, so we're talking about here as one of the other, like, what is it, four two, fourth, fifth technology? Uh, we're talking about uh, the artificial intelligence, uh, new neural networks. It's all still sort of related, um, very kind of direct segue there. Uh, so artificial intelligence is getting uh, very good at identifying uh, two things. Show um, you show it a million pictures, and it can tell you with pretty good accuracy uh, which ones uh, depict a particular thing. Uh, but AI is hopeless at um, generating images of that thing by itself. So it's it's really good at identifying it if you ask it by looking at pictures. But if you tell it to make it, uh, create it, it can't exactly do that. Um, but if it could do that, it would be able to create um, realistic but synthetic pictures depicting whatever uh, in various settings, um, such as pedestrians, for instance. Like if you can, you know, you can recognize recognize a pedestrian, but if you ask it to draw a pedestrian or to create one, it it can't. So, uh, but if it could, uh, it could uh, depict or 
imagine you would say uh, pedestrians in various settings but then a self-driving car could use these images to train itself without having to go on the road so it's it's one thing to give it content in the neural network and to have it um, learn off of that but you need more information so it would be useful if it could generate or imagine uh, its own Right. Images and then uh, you know learn well, from that. I had already run into technology where they they, where they were doing that. I, I, there was like a, it goes back and forth between these. Uh, um, anyway, go ahead. There's, there's read more about it. Well, yeah. So because uh, uh, Kitty, no, you can't have the cookies. Stop. Yeah. No, we need to add him to the uh, the thing. Uh, so I did. Okay. Good. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the, the whole problem with this is that creating something new, uh, entirely new requires imagination. And as I was saying, and that's something that AIs lack. Um, uh, so what, you know, what, what do you do? Um, the solution, uh, first occurred to Ian Goodfellow, who was a PhD student at university of Montreal. Uh, and this was back in 2014. And, uh, the approach is known as gener generative adversarial network or yeah, GAN. Okay. That's, what, that's yeah. exactly what I thought. Yeah. Right. No, so this is it's just because it, I knew about this. I was like, wait a minute. They, they can do that. And I'm like, you're telling me they can't? That's not true. Uh, okay. I guess I was just reading more recent um, information. So go ahead. Well, it started in 2014, but um, yeah, was, I'm sure they're... Ages ago. It exactly. Did, it technology. So the fact that it's breakthrough of 2018 yeah. must be new must information. Be it's, uh, yeah, more, more development. Mm -hmm. the, exactly. You know, so he takes two neural networks, the simplified mathematical model uh, of the human brain, which is neural neural network, neural network uh, that underpins most uh, modern machine learning, uh, and pits them against each other in a digital cat and mouse game. So both networks are trained on the same data set. Uh, one, known as generator, is tasked with creating various or variations on images that it's already already seen, perhaps a picture of a pedestrian with an extra arm. The second, known as the discriminator, is asked to identify whether the example it sees is like the images it has been trained to or a fake produced by the generator. And basically. Is, and, and so basically what they have is growth and pruning right. for Shiva and Shakti. They have the, the, uh, the, they finally have the two brain halves. It's the first time that they've started to have the, well, or the pedants versus the creatives. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, have, they have the two aspects that are necessary for creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're uh, training each other. Um, one is, uh, so by looking at his data set, it tries to figure out how likely it is that a three-armed person would be real. Yeah. One's, one is, how are these things, uh, it, what is similar, and the other is, what is, uh, you know, what is, what's not perfect about it? When we, you know, it's the one that's searching for analogies versus the other one that's searching for perfection of, uh, you know, and, and so it's a, a different kind of uh, two different ways of looking at things that basically we, in, in humans we identify as creative types versus, you know, the more uh, uh, scientific types. We'll, we'll put it the nice, uh, nicer way. Pragmatic, yeah. Pragmatic. <laughs> yeah, it definitely uh, is exactly that. One is creating random shit that is like, a, what yeah. about this? What about this? What about that? And then uh, because they're based on a certain data set, so it's like being creative based on a particular set, while the other one is using that same set and is looking at it and going like, well, based on what I've seen, the probability of what you are now giving me is yeah. this much. Similarity and so they train each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's basically, it's just a growth in pruning. You see that all throughout nature. So, yeah, they're finally mimicking what, what you know, nature has been showing us this entire time. Yeah. So, yeah, over time, uh, the generator can become so good at producing images that the discriminator can't spot fakes. Uh, so, essentially, the generator has been taught to recognize and then create uh, realistic-looking images of pedestrians. Uh, so the technology has become one of the most promising advances in AI in the past decade. So it's able to help machines uh, produce results that fool even humans, it's which is the goal. That's the point. Exactly. It's, it's, exactly. It, exactly. Imagination. Actually, there, yeah. There's finally imagination and creativity in AI. This is the first mm -hmm. indication that strong AI is on the horizon, period. We will create 
general AI that is capable of thinking the way that a human is, or at least th thinking at the level a human is capable of thinking. Which is probably why Elon Musk was uh, giving that uh, talk recently. Uh, co well, a yeah. couple of six months back or whatever it was, where he's like, be scared, be very scared. This is coming. <laughs> yeah, it looks like anybody who understands that that leap right there, I mean, there was one of the first leaps in AI was uh, was the back propagation, and that made uh, neural networks possible uh, to actually work. And then now this one, this is a huge, gigantic fucking leap in what uh, is necessary for making real actual artificial intelligence and not just some you know some algorithm that does what it's what it's told it's, this is basically taking things that are generalities things that are probabilities and searching through them and, and using you know many different probability densities to you know come up with uh, with something that will actually match uh it's it's a new it's new creation it's what it is it's the ability to take error and turn it into precision and that's the and and that is what creativity is. We've basically gotten at the very core, the very heart of creativity, which is one of the most central differences between human intellect and machine intellect. And it's it's the use of this what's different versus what's the same, and going back and forth between difference and same, and difference and same, and and, and that is that is what makes and it, that is that's basically the heart of creativity. That's all I can. <laughs> it's the only way I can really express it. Explains why. Uh... It's uh, notable um, to the point of being a scientific f fact, practically, that uh, creative people or people of genius actually procrastinate uh, probably to create, probably because their brain is going back and forth between the, the two the two modes. But um, back to the the GANs, uh, which is the the shorthand for for this uh, system. Hold on, my mic is being loose. Uh, you slut. All right. Um, GANs have been uh, put to use uh, creating realistic sounding speech and photorealistic fake imagery. In one compelling example, uh, researchers uh, from chipmaker NVIDIA, and uh, anyone who's a gamer or has PCs is intimately familiar with all the many updates to NVIDIA you have to do all the time. Um, the f chipmaker NVIDIA primed a GAN with a celebrity photograph to create hundreds of credible faces of people who didn't exist. Another research group uh, made not unconvincing fake paintings that look like works of Van Gogh. So pushed further, GANs can reimagine images in different ways, making a sunny road appear snowy or turning horses into zebras. So we're finally getting to the point of it actually working. So instead of um, the deep learning uh, or, or neural nets, as we talked, you know, um, I need to find what, what episode uh, it was, like 25? I don't know, like not that long ago, uh, 20? Um we, we talked about, which uh, to be fair, that's like five to 10 months, but we talked about um, AI and uh, neural networks and lear deep learning and all that. And it was sort of a, a joke because, you know, the whole, uh, the whole newsworthy element of it was that you ask it to recognize um, horses and it just uh, sees horses in landscapes and so you have, you know, the, the, the nightmare images, the, the dream learning, deep yeah. learning, whatever, you know. Uh, so it was kind of a, a ridiculous joke. But now with GANs, we actually finally have AI uh, that works the way it's supposed to work, where you, you know, like magic, you tell it to do a thing and it does it, like turning a horse into a zebra. So we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, editing with the help of AI. Oh, yay. <laughs> uh, where you can um, reimagine images. Uh, paintings look like, actually look like Van Gogh or NVIDIA uh, priming. Well, it's that a human can't discriminate. In other words, it can generate. It's a mini Turing generate, test. Right, exactly. It is a, a mini Turing test when it comes to visual imagery at the very minimum. Is that it is capable of creating images that a human can't, uh, doesn't know that were created by a computer entirely. And it was generated, these are generated from scratch. It's all it basically has is, is the equivalent of, equivalence of memories. It has memories because of its experiences with uh, numerous images. And then from those memories, it can generate something new. It is capable of art. And so that is, uh, you know, that, that's why it's such a major breakthrough. But why is it specifically listed for this year since it was started back in 2014? Uh, because it's uh, something that NVIDIA has been doing, um, you know, just recently. Well, what's the advance, though? It's going to be just more, just more advances this year, just that, that that's a big deal this year or something? 
Um, I think yeah, the the all of the stuff that I'm talking about Nvidia doing. Oh, specifically yeah. the Nvidia stuff was this year. And right, right. Oh uh, well, they primed uh, again, which um, with celebrity photographs. Let's see okay. what's what's again. Um, the generative uh, generative adversarial network. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that uh, generative adversarial. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, they primed it with images of celebrities uh, to create hundreds of credible faces. Yeah. So we finally have, uh, so the problem was of creativity of create, not, not creativity, which that too, but creation specifically. Right. So in the past, you know, you could, you could say yes or no to a question, is this a fence or is this a bird? Right. And the network could be like, yes or no with, right. with varying accuracy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with questionable accuracy. Right. Sometimes. Yeah. And now it can, uh, actually create realistic looking faces that don't exist from samples mm -hmm. or it can create images so of van gogh who there's a lot of people don't, don't producing exist. ai there's a lot of different companies individuals etc producing ai so there are people who go out there and they experience ai and they think it's one thing and it's like oh i've seen this ai that's really shitty at, at identifying this so AI is shit. No, that's one person's shitty program. That's like judging all apps in the app store based on the one shit app that you pulled down. It doesn't make any sense to do so, but people do that. So it's just something people need to understand that there's going to be all these stories about how shitty AI is. And they're, they're taking one person's production of an AI as the general, you know, idea of all AI. Whereas there's, of course very greatly varying levels of sophistication and um you know ability in the various ais that have been developed so just just be aware of that yeah um that's very true um but uh this is uh very specifically like very direct uh ai for like creating uh, realistic sounding speech, yeah. photorealistic fake imagery these, these with these NVIDIA, professionally, yeah. These right, the, professionally, yeah. These are one, the ones done by the best in the field. Now, there are ones that are done by even large companies that suck. Uh, but, you know, there's going to be ones that are done by academic groups, and, and one academic group may be far superior to another. Just The, the point is, is that the whole progress of AI cannot be judged based on the middle or the worst has to be judged on the best. You have to judge and say, okay, where is AI? Well, what is the very best uh, instance of what are the very best abilities that we have seen in any AI that anyone has produced? That is the, is the state of the field because they are the new standard, because they are the leader, because they are the ones who have been successful. So it's just, uh, you know, it's just kind of funny that I even have to broach this, but I've seen so many times people talking about, I, I, shit, look at this. Let's look at this one example of how shitty it is. Yeah, but that's one shitty example. How do you not get this? Uh, that's... Maybe you yourself are AI. <laughs> <laughs> NPCs. Um, that, that's the interesting thing about AI that may not be um, easily apparent to people who don't have much experience with it, which uh, if you can start watching some videos on YouTube or or elsewhere of different AI groups and presenters, et cetera, you can actually start seeing it for yourself that there's a vast difference between different AI researchers and makers. It's actually really interesting how varied that field can be. You can have, uh, because like there's so many parts to it, like some, because some try to do like a full animatronic robot type thing. Others focus just on a chatterbot. So there's in you know, two aspects you have, when you're creating a full Android, you have the brain and the, and the face. So, you know, you have the ones that move realistically, but like, you know, have like five sentences that are pre-generated. And then you have others that are, uh, you know, the whole point is to try to, you know, seem like a full genuine person. And then you have others that skirt around not sounding like a genuine person and having issues with, you know, being like foreign. And then you have Tay, which, you know, is once again, uh, uh, learning in, uh, uh, wise. It's it, what is it? Neural network as we were talking about where it learns. Um, but then there's others that are just, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> that are just pre-programmed. Uh, so there's, uh, a lot of variation and variability in the field of AI. And you wouldn't think that it would have as much variability as it does. Uh, because some other fields, you know, it's really not that, that 
di- that much difference between the the different researchers who do the same thing. Like normally, it's pretty consistent. If you have professionals uh, of a certain in a certain field, they're all pretty equal. Well, they're but they're to do very different tasks. Exactly. Like this uh, ability to do things with images does not necessarily translate over to other topics. Uh, an image is. Uh, it, it's 2D. That's the thing, and so there's a you know there's a there's a simplicity to a basic image that um, that allows the AI to be developed in a way that is um, more straightforward. And so I believe that that whereas you know what they're doing with images uh, it shows a methodology that is extremely valuable. That methodology still has to be catered to other tasks, and still once again. Just because we've created a damn good alternator now, uh, it doesn't mean that we can fucking make an entire engine. Uh, an engine, and, and even once we make, we can make all the different pieces. We still haven't made an engine until we put it together in the right fucking way. <laughs> what? You're laughing. Yeah, it's just something egregious. One of our patrons said, "It's, uh, it's like, damn. <laughs> so why I've been hoarding all these alternators?" <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry to be the one to tell you that all those alternators aren't going to be helpful. Not going to be helpful. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so the variation in the field of AI is, is massive. And, uh, and still, you know, even with GANs, uh, they're not always perfect. So GANs can conjure up bicycles with uh, two sets of handlebars or faces with eyebrows in the wrong place or, you know, so it's still... It still has a you know learning yeah, the to do. Recognition uh, is not perfect yet, so therefore the uh, you know the, the generation is not perfect yet. But it's it's just a gigantic leap is the point. It's the, exactly it, it the ability be, at all. Right, it, it cannot be stressed exactly how huge this leap is, even though there's still a long way to go. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, speaking of a long way to go, or uh, at least. Uh, sci-fi-esque stuff uh our next breakthrough technology of 2018 is uh babble fish earbuds whoa 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 Whoa. see i was just uh recently talking about something similar to that where it's it kind of always fascinated me the the idea of being able to do this and um they had that um ability on google translate type app so like it kind of just kind of really fascinates me that you can use the app obviously it's not perfect because that's one thing that did disappoint me is that google translate isn't ideal as uh, someone who does speak two languages fluently i it definitely doesn't do a good job it's definitely not ideal, <laughs> definitely not ideal. but <laughs> so no thanks google your translate is not the best but the fact that you have an app altogether google translate uh voice thing right i uh, use uh, it maybe have like a may actually be babble something name of it i don't know but you like put up the app and then and, you know, you put up, put it up to a person who speaks and then that motherfucker translates what they're saying on a different language. That's so cool. So cool. But, um, yeah, the Babblefish is, uh, you know, in the cult uh, sci-fi classic Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, you slide a yellow Babblefish um, into your ear and you get uh, translations uh, immediately of different languages, alien languages. But, uh, you know, in the real world, Google did uh, come up with an interim solution. It's a $159 pair of earbuds, uh, which are called Pixel Buds, which, uh, you know, I, I know people who pay $159 for, like, regular um, headphones, so. Um, So these work uh, with a Pixel smartphone and a Google Translate app, and they produce a practically real-time translation. So a person wears earbuds, and the other one holds the phone. uh, So the the wearer um, of the earbuds um, speaks in their language, and the app translates it, and it plays it out loud on the phone. And the person responds on the phone, and it translates it and plays it through the earbuds. So the headphones, they both uh, trans like they they give you sound uh, that is translated, but they also pick up the speech that is given by the person who is saying it. So you can have full time, almost real time, full conversations. It isn't just one direction. Yeah. You can hear them and speak to them with the phone's help. 
Wait, wait, when you speak to them, it also translates to the other direction? Right, so you say, so you're wearing the headphones, mm -hmm. and you speak in your language, Yeah. and the other person holds the phone app, and it says stuff. Okay. And then they speak to the app, and then that app feeds into your ear. Cool. Yeah, they speak in their language to the app, and then, yeah. Uh, so, um, earbud wears, uh, speak language and of course English is the default. Truthfully, they should just have a double pair of earbuds. They need to, they need to make a little device that is a, a double pair of earbuds and so that it just translates both directions, but I guess it's going to be hard to do. Yeah, it seems like they would have if they could. Um, not necessarily. Sometimes but... people just like the obvious design, they somehow just skip it. <laughs> So yeah, Google Translate already has a conversation feature, which is useful. So that can you can do that through the phones. So I guess now maybe it's their first introduction of the headphones, like proof of concept, see if it works, and then they're gonna work on having two different headphones. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, Google Translate already has a conversation feature, and uh, it's iOS and Android apps. Uh, let the users speak um, as it automatically figures out what language they're using. Uh, but background noise can make it difficult for the app to understand what people are saying. And uh, it's also hard to figure out when one person stopped and the other one started. so Or when it's uh, one person stopped and it's uh, time to start translating. So uh, Pixel Buds get around these problems because the wearer uh, taps and holds a finger on the right earbud while talking. So it's all like oh, <laughs> cool, cool science-y, uh, sci-fi. Um, splitting the interaction between the phone and the earbuds it gives each person control of a microphone and it helps the speaker maintain eye contact uh, since they're not trying to pass the phone back and forth. So that seems to be the reason why um, they have, which they could just seem, it seems like they could just do that with, with their um, earbuds too, but uh, the reason they have a phone and an earbud is to go around the issue um, that you have with this kind of technology apparently of not like microphone um 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 what's the word not preference but dominance i don't know whatever <laughs> <laughs> issues with microphone uh interference so because they said that the article mentions that it's it's about microphone control uh to have both phone and headphones but it seems like each pair of headphones should be able to do that. So, like, I don't know. The way the the way the article is, it just made it seem like it's important to have phone and headphones separately yeah. for this technology to work. But it seems like you could just have two headphones and it would still work. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um. Bum bum bum. So the Pixel, yeah, the Pixel Buds, eye contact, passing the phone, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, some people, or not some people, or maybe like critics or whatever, uh, the Pixel Buds were widely panned um, for subpar designed. Uh, they uh, look silly, according to some people, and they may not fit well, uh, which, you know, I don't know if that's eyewitness experience or what. Um, they can also be hard to set up with the phone, which, you know, I amen to that. Any kind of Bluetooth or otherwise technology is, is hard to set up. But, I mean, we're talking about translating another language into your ears. That's pretty, pretty badass. So yeah. give them some time. They'll, they'll, yeah, they'll figure it out. It out. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a false start. They're getting there. So now we're going to pivot completely and all together. <laughs> so the next break breakthrough technology of this year, uh, so saying goodbye to all these cool things, looking forward to new ones next year, as uh, zero carbon natural gas. I have no idea what that means. What does it mean? <laughs> um, clean coal. Well, <laughs> clean coal. Uh, the world is probably stuck with natural gas as one of our primary resources for the foreseeable future, which that sucks, but um, cheap and ready, readily available. It's there um, everywhere. 
but um, there's some corporations that are collaborating together and um, they are trying to have um, natural gas plants and uh, produce carbon-free energy from a fossil fuel, which I have no idea how they're going to do that. But uh, <laughs> Probably sequestering the carbon through the process. I mean, like, in other words, just like having some, just, just processing the output. Um, yeah, it's trying to see if it can, it's a particular pa pilot power plant just outside of Houston. And they're trying to see if they can have uh, clean energy from natural gas. Trying to see if they could have it a reality. And it's a company behind a 50 megawatt project called Net Power. Uh, believes you can generate power at least as cheaply as standard natural gas and capture essentially the same amount of carbon dioxide, uh, uh, sorry, and capture essentially all the carbon dioxide released in the process. So they're trying to... So basically uh, they, they're redesigning the process. They think right. they can just, they just have a superior technology for, uh, for producing energy and they think they can output the same amount of energy even with the loss from, from capturing the carbon through superior tech. That sounds cool. Yeah, it's a collaboration between like, whoa, sorry, RIP your ears. Uh, it's a collaboration between uh, quite a few companies. And um, yeah, it looks like the plant uh, puts the carbon dioxide released from the burning of natural gas under high pressure and heat, and then using the resulting supercritical CO2 as the quote unquote working fluid that drives a specially built turbine. So much of the carbon dioxide can be continuously recycled and the rest uh, can be captured. So there, um, it seems like if it's, um, drives a turbine, it seems like they can get even more energy out of whatever that is. Uh, so it's a, a key part of pushing down the costs, uh, depends on selling that carbon dioxide. So today the main use is in helping uh, to extract oil from petroleum wells. Well, that's not good. <laughs> um, that's a limited market and not a particularly green one. Uh, eventually, however, Net Power uh, hopes to see growing demand for carbon dioxide in cement manufacturing and in making plastics and arbor other carbon-based uh, materials. So their um, Net Power technology won't solve all the problems, of course, with uh, natural gas. Uh, particularly the extraction side, but as long as we're using natural gas, we might as well use it as cleanly as possible. And if you're going to recycle or reuse any parts of it, you know, it makes sense. So all of the clean energy technologies uh, that are being uh, developed, Net Powers is one of the furthest along, and it promises more than just a marginal advance uh, by cutting an emission here or there. It like actually captures, you know, most of it. It just the question is, you know, how do we how do we sell it? <laughs> All right, how do we sell things? Uh, good question. So the next one is. Um, Perfect online privacy. What does that mean? Um, who knows? Nobody knows. Um, no, but it's... <laughs> we can never know. You can Next. never know. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's um, apparently a tool that is now available, uh, which is a true internet privacy could finally become possible thanks to a new tool that can, for instance, let you prove you're over 18 without revealing your date of birth, or prove you have enough money in the bank for a financial transaction without revealing your balance or other details. Uh, the limit um, that limits the risks um, of privacy breaches or identity theft. Uh, now the tool is an emerging cryptographic protocol called a zero knowledge proof. Uh, the researchers have worked on it for decades. Interest has exploded in the past year, and thanks in part to the growing obsession with cryptocurrencies, most of which uh, aren't private. Uh, and a lot of times, like the one of the creators of cryptocurrencies, like doesn't even reveal his real name. So that's they're very interested in privacy. <laughs> There's an, an event diagram of uh, cryptocurrency like lovers and, and privacy lovers. Um, much of the uh, credit for practical zero knowledge proof goes to Zash Zcash. Zcash, a digital currency that launched in late 2016. 
Zcash's developers use a method called uh, ZK snark for zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. That's sexy for some reason. Um, to give users the power to uh, transact anonymously. Uh, that's not possible in Bitcoin and most other public blockchain systems in which transactions are visible to everyone. Uh, though these transactions are theoretically anonymous, they can be combined with other data to track and identify users. Uh, Vitaly Buterin, creator of Ethereum, the world's second most popular blockchain network, has described uh, ZK Snark as an absolutely game-changing technology. Uh, for banks, this could be a way to use blockchain in payment systems without sacrificing the client's privacy. Uh, apparently last year, JP Morgan Chase added ZK Snark uh, to its own blockchain-based uh, payment system. So like big banks are adopting this. So for all their promise though, uh, ZSnarks are computation heavy and slow. They also require a so-called trusted setup creating a cryptogenic key that could compromise the whole system. And yeah, for me in general, it's kind of like Equifax. Anytime you have like one system that controls everything, it's incredibly it's vulnerable point, yeah. to failure. Yeah, central point of failure, yeah. Um, so that's not a cool thing, but... Um, all right, our next um, technology is genetic fortune telling. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, what we're talking about here is that um, one day babies will get DNA report cards uh, at birth. Uh, and they almost can already with some of the designer baby stuff. But uh, these reports uh, will offer uh, predictions about their chances of suffering a heart attack or cancer or getting booked or uh, sorry, getting hooked on tobacco and of being uh, smarter than average and, you know, things like that. So um, this article piece is talking about um, what do your genes or what does your DNA, what does your DNA say about you? Uh, so when you have your baby that is born, this is not quite, you know, design a baby where you create your own baby. It's just that once it is born, uh, they can tell you, the Basically, doctors. This is the technology from Gattaca. No, it's yeah, yeah. The that. doctors can tell you what, yeah, you're yeah. Uh, exactly Gattaca. A uh, great movie. I uh, highly recommend. They can tell you what your issues are going to be <laughs> or your baby that is. Um, so uh, there's science that is making it uh, possible to have these report cards um, possible. And it suddenly arrived now thanks to uh, huge genetic studies. Uh, and some of these studies involved more than a million people. That's a crazy amount of people for a study. Like a crazy amount of people. So it turns out that most common uh, diseases and many behaviors and traits, including intelligence, are a result of not one or two, but many genes acting in concert. We already knew that. So but. look forward to uh, genetic testing leading to uh, you becoming part of a list. Uh. <laughs> yep. Or not getting jobs or getting jobs. Um, so, so maybe this wasn't supposed to be on the positive list? <laughs> maybe they were mistaken about this being on the positive list? Well, they list. said breakthroughs, period. <laughs> Um, so using data from large ongoing genetic studies, scientists are creating what they call polygenic, polygenic risk sources. Uh, the, the new DNA tests offer probabilities, not diagnoses, they could greatly benefit medicine. Yes, that's what it is. Uh, for example, if women at high risk for breast cancer uh, get more mammograms, or those at low risk got fewer, um, those exams might catch more real errors uh, and set off fewer false alarms and actually cause less uh, breast cancer um, and people who are not that likely to have it in the first place. Um, pharmaceutical companies can also use these scores uh, in clinical trials of preventative drugs for illnesses like Alzheimer's or heart disease. By picking volunteers who are more likely to get sick, they can more accurately test how well the drugs work. Uh, the trouble is, of course, the predictions are far from perfect. Who wants to know that they might develop Alzheimer's? Um, and what if someone with a low risk score for cancer was off being uh, screened and then develops cancer anyway, things like that. Now, polygenic scores are also uh, controversial because they can predict, uh, they, they can predict um, any trait not only diseases. For instance, they can forecast about 10% of a person's performance on IQ tests. Or as scores improve, it's likely that DNA IQ predictions will become routinely available. But how will parents and educators use that information? <laughs> That's the real question. 
Um, so that's exactly what we're talking about is that uh, how will they use that um, report card because you can tell uh, more things than one uh, and so if you can tell things like that uh, like IQ etc based on somebody's DNA that invites all sorts of uncomfortable questions about things <laughs> like race and gender and oh just so much uncomfortable stuff so that that definitely isn't isn't a, a good time <laughs> and uh it's it's one thing to have um jobs and and other things like teachers and parents uh, and doctors, like it, it's one thing you can have implications on your health. And then if parents do it, it can have implications on how they nurture their children. But then of course it also has implications for employment when it comes to IQ. And then it has implications for all those uncomfortable gender and race questions. If you know, DNA makeup can predict not just diseases, but a variety of traits like IQ performance and IQ test performance and other things like what yeah, well, what? I mean, there's going to be a uh, reach exceeding grasp sort of problem here because the, the truth of the matter is there's huge exceptions uh, in, when it comes to the way the DNA plays out. So yeah, it may be 80% accurate and that sounds good, but 20% of the times it's fucking wrong. You know, it's just like, and people will take something that's like 80% and act like, you know, people have a tendency to look at things in black and white even though they've already been told it's not. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, this means this. When they go, when they think of the 80%, they simplify it in their head, and the way they remember it is, this means this. And it doesn't. It means 80% of the time it's that, which means 20% of the time it's completely fucking wrong. And they never, they never maintain that part of it. They just maintain the 80% of the time means this is good enough, and it's approximate, and it's about, and so I'm gonna remember it that way, that it's this, that this means this. And that's how, it, and eventually, in a very short order, people remember things as this means this, and it doesn't. And that's uh, that's going to be the, uh, one of the problems that they're, they're going to have in these. Well, this predicts this, predict this predicts this, and it's good. That's how it's going to be, you know, stated. Even if people are talking about it, they're going to say, "Well, this predicts that," and it's like, "Well, no, it doesn't." Eighty percent of the time, yeah, that's a good prediction, and twenty percent is a fucking huge goddamn portion of, of like, say, if you take. You know, 20% of the entire human population, you're talking about billions of people, right? Well, not let's see, 20. No, okay, no, maybe not. But the point is, it's a lot of people. <laughs> it's like, there's a, uh, uh, you, the, 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 the point is that there's a, and then, and then there's a way in which we understand genetics in general. It, it doesn't, it's more complex than we currently understand very well. And so a lot of times we, we kind of make these sweeping generalizations about a system that, is multi-layered and uh, and that we don't understand it quite as well as um, is often represented that we do. We do understand uh, a lot, uh, but there's just there's so much to understand about the way the genetics works. There's there's additional layers about you know the, the they don't. So much ends up happening through emergence and through the contextual cues and uh, you know come there are complexities to DNA that are far more um, difficult than we necessarily recognize. Like for instance, the non-coding sections of DNA, we're talking about like 95% of our DNA uh, is, is these areas that don't appear to do anything, yet there's, there's strong indications that they, have, that they have a structure and therefore they might actually you know, have impacts on things like epigenetics. And, you know, epigenetics, oh, we've only recently started to understand that genetic memory exists. That's a very recent thing. There's, I'm sure there's tons of genetic scientists who don't even know that, that genetic memory is, is has been proven. It's just been shown directly. I mean, you know, unless you just want to completely discount the, the you know, the multiple sets of research as utterly, completely, 100% Well, that's only in wrong. mice and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, right. That's only in mice. Oh, please. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> and, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the point is genetic memory exists. And so there's there, there may be... 
a huge amount going on in the non-coding DNA. There's definitely a huge amount going on in the way that uh, you know epigenetics alters the expression of genes. So a person may have recessive traits that are not being expressed, and so there's you know there's just you could literally just change the vitamins. Just start giving somebody folic acid, and you can change the expression of their genes dramatically across a wide spectrum of genes. And so saying they have this gene isn't it's not very informative and so people will oversimplify this they will use it the wrong freaking way and that's that's unfortunate down straight um i have nothing to add to, nothing to, add to that <laughs> <laughs> that's all i've got to say about that um this this is something up here ali um the next breakthrough is quantum leap <laughs> oh no! But, oh oh wait, no. it's the material science. Okay, they're not yeah. idiots. They know no. what they're doing. No, it's um, <laughs> it's materials quantum leap. So, um, the prospect of powerful uh, quantum computers comes with a puzzle. Uh, they'll uh, they'll be capable of feats of computation inconceivable with today's machines. And that's bullshit. Okay, go ahead. But we haven't yet fi well, I'm just saying what they're saying. I know. <laughs> but we haven't yet figured out what we might do with these powers. Uh, one likely and enticing possibility, precisely designing molecules. Uh, chemists are already dreaming of new proteins for far more effective drugs, I'm sure they are. Uh, novel electrolytes for better batteries and compounds that could turn sunlight directly into liquid fuel and much more uh, efficient solar cells. For instance, uh, we don't have these things because molecules are ridiculously hard to model on a classical computer. Try simulating the behavior of the electrons in even a relatively simple molecule and you run into complexities far beyond the capabilities of today's computers. I have no idea why, but that's the thing apparently. But uh, it's an actual problem for quantum computers, which instead of digital bits representing uh, ones and zeros, use qubits uh, that are themselves quantum systems. Recently, IBM researchers use a quantum computer with seven qubits to model a small molecule made of three atoms. Uh, it should become possible to accurately simulate far larger and more interesting molecules as scientists build machines with more qubits and just as important, better quantum algorithms. So what the fuck are qubits? Uh, okay. Quantum computing is, um, one of these things where basically there's a tremendous amount of interpretation and a whole lot of fucking bullshit, uh, stacked on top of real technology. And that is, um, there's something called analog computation and, uh, and quantum annealing uh, that is actually just the quantum version of simulated annealing. And these have to do with analog computation. Now, analog computation is basically the use of interference in waves. Uh, and now that's something real, physical, makes sense. It's not, you're not talking about, the only time you talk about multiple dimensions is sometimes you can use math. You can add additional dimensions as a way to keep up with more numbers and shit and associate them, but it does not mean that they exist in another fucking reality. Okay, that's what, there's multi-dimensional math used in fluid mechanics and in a variety of other applications that have nothing to do with other fucking realities or other real actual dimensions or new, you know, new properties to reality. It's still one fucking 3D reality, but you happen to use four dimensions, five dimensions, etc to represent that 3D reality. So there, there's, since the advent of quantum magic uh, bullshit, people have started believing that the use of an additional dimension means that that actual dimension exists in reality instead of thinking that it is a tool, a mathematical tool. They can't separate the tool that they're using from the reality. They're, they think they're one thing because there's something wrong with their brain. So the, the thing is, that leads to confusion about what is actually occurring with quantum computers. The ideas behind quantum computers that people talk about, that they can comp compute in multiple realities simultaneously because it can re represent all these multiple... It's No, seriously, they, they have this magical bullshit 
around quantum computation that will never, ever, ever, ever work. It might get some idiots to spend millions of dollars because, you know, you can pretend with, with techno babble that you're actually going to do something magical. But the truth of the matter is it's magic. It's bullshit. It's not real. There is, however, real physics that makes sense that work and that is analog computation and because atoms are a wave system you can do computations with minute wave systems at the quantum level so basically when you are putting wave systems together they do interfere uh, on just, this, this this subject pisses me off yes you're right you're, you're looking at me like well, why are you so pissed off because because people have been talking about quantum computing and with magical bullshit terms for so long, it's just it just pisses me off every time I hear it repeated. Uh, and so the so the thing is, there is something real that is being done under the surface, and it is a and it is the you can have wave systems that interfere, and this is basically a complex representation of you know it. it Okay, there are different ways in which you can do computation. The first computer was Babbage's uh, analytical engine, or it was his difference engine. I forget which one came first, but basically it's just a big set of gears, and it works, but it's gears. Where are the numbers? There are no numbers. There's no fucking numbers. There's just <laughs> gears, okay? And, I mean, yeah, you can put labels on it to represent the numbers, but the point is that it's done with gears. There are ways to do computation that have that where you use physical phenomena that are mechanical in nature so they can't just be willy-nilly all over the place they have to work in a very particular way and that's why math that's why mathematics is uncannily good at representing reality because it can't just willy-nilly fly all over the place because reality can't just willy-nilly fly all over the fucking place reality is mechanical so mathematics are good at representing mechanics but mathematics can also represent magical stupid bullshit too also, you can do that with mathematics when you the way in which you connect the what you're representing with the mathematics when you have a faulty conception of what it represents, and that's the problem with quantum computing is that there is a faulty conception of what is being done, and that and the thing is the engineers down at that level they're just getting pressured to make something to fucking work, and you know so what they're going to do? Does it work? That's the question. Partially, it's only good at certain tasks because uh, analog computation is only it is it, well. First off, because they are they're being forced to work within certain ideas and try to make magic work. They're using something that really does work as a, like a stopgap and hoping for the best that all of this quantum magic bullshit will somehow make something special happen. And it's not. It's not happening. The the uh, all of the quantum computers that are out there. They are f kind of good at the one particular task, but they're not any better than, you know, they, they actually don't even out, uh, um, out compute regular computers, even at what they're doing, even though they technically should once they get to a certain level of sophistication. But there is a, the, the way that they're having to design it, because they're, they have to make these super quiet systems, they have no interference from the outside because of the, the um, how much the system can easily be perturbed. Uh, makes it so that there is like a diminishing returns on attempting to make that system noise free. So just the methodology that they're using because of the magical bullshit terminology is actually making the development of the technology lag behind of where it could go if they just recognize that they're attempting to develop analog computation more. They're trying and truthfully, it's not just analog computation that's the best, it's analog digital hybridization, which was started back in the frickin' seventies. And it was actually a, uh, it, it, it should have been what took over, but unfortunately there was just the way digital uh, was easy to produce, made it dominant, and so it may, even as an inferior technology, it still progressed because of, because of its availability, because of its convenience, it was just a timing, and it, it's not because it's a superior technology. Sometimes superior technologies do not make it to the forefront because they don't make it to market in time because of just circumstance. Sometimes the best technology loses because of circumstance. That's, you know, that's, that's kind of how biology progresses. Sometimes it's not the very best biological system that, that, uh, that you know, you know um, fills a, a competitive niche in biology. It's, a, it's whatever got to that niche first that fills it up and, and anything else that would have been better, more efficient, doesn't necessarily even ever make it. And that happens to technology. So that's basically where we are now is that 
quantum computing is slowly they're eventually going to pull out of this shit because eventually the engineers who are being forced to try to make something are going to stop listening to the theoretical bullshit that they're that they're being told they're supposed to make happen that that is just entirely magical thinking multiple com computing in multiple realities nonsense and uh they're going to just they're just going to focus on digital analog hybridization and then it'll start working better and then it will be a massive advance in computing but right now it's not yeah uh, every time we uh, see anything about quantum computing they say it will be yeah, exactly. Oh, it will be. But, yeah. like, they've been talking about quantum computing for, like, ten years at least. Yeah, and they've, well, and they've, we've got a quantum computer, and it does uh, this tiny little thing that you know, other computers can do way better, that your, your fucking phone can do better. You know, it's like, <laughs> uh, we built this huge machine, it costs, uh, you know, $80 million, and, and, and it's called uh, Blue Wave, and, and it's, well, there's lots of hype behind it, and it really doesn't do a fucking thing. Well, what is it? I, I still don't understand what it... Well, they, they basically, they try to put atoms in a, a state of communication with, you, with each other that is sort of like a sort of like a Bose-Einstein condensate okay. where there's like they, they were, where basically they are locked together in a way that makes it so that they're in communication with each other in a but way that is that... not chaotic that it's a quiet system that only... But how does that help? Because... It, it basically they're they're doing an analog computation. They're um, when when you look at the states of a given atom and then combine it with the states of other atoms, you can change them in certain ways, and that that they will affect each other. And the population of them uh, kind of acts like the machinery in gears and set, et cetera of a uh, you know a, of a, a computation machine. And so there's a, there's a way to design it so that those states, when perturbed in one way, mean uh, you, you can you look at the way in which this one's perturbed, which plus the way that this one's perturbed, plus this one, and then those things combined will give you something else. It's just a, it's another method of computation. It's uh, I'm not going to explain to you how to compute with ropes and stuff. They, though there are systems in which you can take ropes and knots or, or an abacus and you can p compute with those. This is just similar to that, except it's done with uh, a very quiet system and the and the properties of atoms. What do you mean it's quiet? Uh, the, they're, they're, you're constantly bombarded by various um, uh, types of interference from uh, you know local magnetic fields and well, all kinds of things are constantly there's tons of noise in any given place um, you know from all the radio waves and you have to you have to eliminate all of that to keep them from impacting the uh, the atoms which you're uh, using for quantum computation which is why it's so fucking hard the way that they're doing it, uh, because the, keeping the noise out of it makes it, it is, it's just, it's just nearing impossible to make a quiet environment for the computation to actually not be in, impacted by tons of noise. Uh, and truthfully, they need to be going the other direction. They need to be using the, uh, the ability for like that, that AI can use very in generalities and things that have a tremendous amount of noise to, and be able to recognize certain things. They, they're using it the wrong fucking way. And that's why it's it's not very much a valid. Um, that's why it's not doing anything. That's why it's why it's not going anywhere because they're using it in the wrong way, and, and they're trying to they're trying to make it too perfect. And their uh, their their focus on perfection is actually uh, pedantry that's going to get in the way of any you know real development. It's like that uh, creativity versus yeah. where the printing versus. Yeah. They, they, need to be, they, they need to be able to use it as a noisy system. They need to be able to, to, they need to be working on using quantum systems in a noisy environment and being able to use population densities as their, their computation method instead of, you know, uh, more exacting methods that they're attempting right now. Sure. <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> um... And one of the final topics, news things that we have here on our thing that I can't find. Uh, there it is. Oh, I can't play. Oops. There we go. We have bionic mushrooms. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> 
So, bionic mushrooms fuse nanotech, bacteria, and fungi. That's cool. Um, so, in... Um, this isn't... Uh, I mean, this is pretty recent news. This isn't, like, beginning of the year. This is, like, past two months news. Um, but in the latest feat of engineering, researchers at Stevens Institute of Technology have taken an ordinary white button mushrooms from a grocery store and made it bionic, supercharging it with 3D printed clusters of cyanobacteria that generate electricity and swirls of graphene uh, fucking sweet. ribbons that collect the current. That is fucking awesome. Yeah. So, bionic mushrooms. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. So... So yeah, it's uh they uh yeah they fused it and they made a, a bionic mushroom. I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> what the fuck does it do though? Um. Oh, oops, wrong thing. Um. All right. Well. Uh, let's see. The work reported in November seventh issue of Nano Letters may sound like something straight out of Alice in Wonderland, but the hybrids are part of a broader effort to better improve our understanding of cell biological machinery and how to use those intricate molecular gears and levers to fabricate new technologies. Um, uh, in this case, uh, this is a quote by Manu Manur, an assistant. Uh, in uh, this case, our systems, the bionic mushroom produces electricity by interchanging cyanobacteria that can produce electricity with nanoscale materials capable of collecting the current, we're able to better access the unique properties of both, augment them, and create an entirely new functional bionic system. Um, so cyanobacteria produces electricity, and then the graphene uh, moves it. I don't know why it was on a mushroom, but um, I guess uh, the um, mushroom is the food for the cyanobacteria, because it provides it with rich microbiota. Nutrients, moisture, pH, temperature. Um, it's excellent for cyanobacteria to produce electricity for a longer period of time. So I guess they're exploring the relationship of um, living organisms and electricity and, you know, making, yeah, well, I guess, I mean, biotech. I yeah, guess. And I mean, basically what you've got there is, is uh, some of the beginnings of biotech. I, I, I should have... Uh, they've actually created a programming language for uh, DNA... Uh, a while back, where you could you could make various things with this programming language. So, I mean, biotech is advancing at a really amazing rate. I mean, there's a lot of uh, silos of knowledge in bio in biotech, unfortunately, where you know some people just aren't aware of some of the others. That they, and there could be a little more combination of, of the technologies. But it looks like this is one of those uh, interesting combinations of technology. We're going to we're going to replace all regular technology, regular hard technology with biotech uh, at some point in our future. It may be, you know, 150 years down the line, but eventually it's just a better way of making technology is to grow it. Um, you know, give, take raw materials and I'll allow basically wet nanotech to assemble all your technology and then uh, something that, and then all your technology self heals and, uh, and uses environmental shit to, uh, to reproduce. Yeah, I think we'll be doing that. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll take that. Well, not just that, but uh, to quote um, the one of the aides or the, the person quoted here that was working on the project is like, why are they using bacteria? Well, the, the really cool thing about bacteria is that, um, as he says, with this work, we can imagine enormous opportunities for next generation biohybrid applications. For example, some bacteria can glow while others sense toxins or produce fuel. By seamlessly integrating these microbes with nanomaterials, we could potentially realize many other amazing designs, biohybrids, uh, designer biohybrids for the environment, defense, healthcare, and many other fields. So bacteria in particular are really fucking cool when it comes to a variety of neat shit. Uh, so yeah, that's that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're going to be producing all technology this way. It's, these are, these are the, the baby steps along the way. Um, to, to making technology, but I mean, the, the um, what they've got going there is basically it's it's being able to use the, the energy that you know is collected from the environment by a mushroom to uh, to produce electricity, and then you know I'm sure they can make some sort of biosensor out of it, or who the fuck knows what they're doing with it. But it's probably just right now just kind of a proof of concept for collecting energy and moving it around and being able to provide a structure for it. But I 
mean, they had like uh, the, one of the things that they're working towards is biological diodes. Um, they've already uh, actually years ago there was a biological diode already produced. I, I tried to send that along to the people who are trying to make um, uh, light up uh, trees and stuff instead of um, uh, lamps. And then I sent that technology to them because it, it's not a huge leap from a a biological diode to a biological light emitting diode. Um, so the uh, so that would be uh, one of the things that they would want to do is is make trees that um, are basically gathering energy during the day and outputting it at night. You know, <laughs> so uh, in in the form of LEDs, which is a very con um, very efficient form of, of making light. So it wouldn't you know wouldn't be too much of a burden on the plant to for it to be able to do it. That would be so cool. How like growing lamps. Because the LEDs can get hella bright, but yeah, not take up that much resources. Yep. But uh but yeah, that's it. So uh we left off on uh artificial and grown creatures and biological Looks like it's uh twenty nineteen is gonna be the year of biotech. Making my prediction. The next five years we're seeing uh more and more biotech. I think we're going to have fully functioning bio devices by 2025. There you go. You heard it here first. Uh, now, all right, folks. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up for um, this cherry stem for this, this month. Maybe we'll squeeze one more uh, next weekend, uh, though it's not necessarily the case since we have a lot of cosplay work to do for Sack Anime. Um, but we are going to be doing an after show with patrons and talking about, uh, more in depth technologies, uh, and further, uh, things that happened, uh, in this year and some of our personal favorites and things like that. So definitely become a patron by visiting, uh, Patreon. Uh, dot com slash Anna Cherry uh, pick challenger mode now those images are not the images that you will see as the reward to your pictures uh, trust and safety has been very kind to work with me on uh, um, trust and safetying up my my page uh, so those aren't the pictures but those are the same tiers uh, everything is the same so check that out uh, become a patron hang out with us in the after chat uh, which is what we're about to do now, um, once again, thank you very much. Uh, we were uh, here on our uh, ten. Um, well, we did. We went over a little, a little more than ten. Um, that's for sure. But uh, ten breakthrough uh, technologies of twenty eighteen. Uh, did some cool stuff. Uh, we're gonna go hang out with our patrons now. Thank you for another awesome year of support, uh, patrons and viewers, and anyone who subscribes to the channel or has shared the shows. And uh, definitely keep an eye out on our vlogs and other things on the channel. Uh, but if you like just the podcast, uh, do uh, leave a comment down below, and we will give you uh, an exclusive RSS link. So we will see you soon.